So uh, a very warm and a special welcome uh, to this very special occasion. Uh, let me begin by recognizing Professor Ronel Ewell, the Acting Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities. Of course, Professor Peter Vail. Uh, this is his third time around, and he promises us this is the last time that he's having an inaugural lecture. And obviously, that raises the bar. So we all look forward, in particular, to to this evening's um, inaugural lecture. Um, let me also take this opportunity to recognize Mr. Leon Vessels. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, and uh, Professor Albert Fenter, I've been asked to acknowledge him in particular, our Emeritus Professor, but in particular to recognize Louise. Uh, it's always wonderful to, to, to run into you, given that we uh, uh, shared space somewhere in the Eastern Cape for a while. So it's wonderful to have you, and we, we're certainly grateful that you uh, and, and your family and loved ones uh, and uh, family and loved ones of Peter could make it this evening. Let me also recognize executive and senior leaders of the university, members of Senate and other academic pres academics present, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Sunny Bonani, Khoyanan, Damas and Yera. Good evening, Tobela. So, it's indeed a great honor, a special privilege, uh, for me to welcome you to the professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Peter Vale. Normally, these are nervous moments, I'm told, uh, for the first occasion, although I have it uh, on good account that uh, Professor Peter Vale is somewhat nervous this evening uh, about this important uh, moment. Um, <clears throat> and so this is a somewhat different kind of inauguration. Uh, last night we inaugurated uh, Professor uh, Dalian um, Millard in the Faculty of Law uh, in this very same space. And obviously when it's the first occasion it's somewhat different. Uh, but it was nonetheless a wonderful moment, a joyous moment indeed uh, f uh, last night, as I'm certain uh, this evening um, is also similarly a moment of, of great joy. And so today then is a day that marks, at least from the point of view of the University of Johannesburg, the rites of passage and the entry of Professor Vale into this university's community of distinguished scholars, indeed of this university's most senior scholars. And so it's an office in a position of authority and leadership which we shall not assume lightly. It's one that we shall do so with considerable and ongoing thought, reflection, deliberation, and presence of mind. And so the professorship is not something that we just take for granted. Uh, this is the most senior scholar position uh, in the university year yet in uh, the uni University of Johannesburg, but of course also across South Africa, across the continent, and globally. Uh, and so great credence is put in the office and in the process and the procedures which a university follows in determining whether indeed a candidate uh, has met the criteria for admission into the senior scholarly community of um, uh, the said university. Of course, the inaugural lecture is as much an account for us who sit on uh, the receiving end, examining it, uh, listening to it, turning it over. Um, and so it is, it, it is as much an important occasion for the scholar, Professor Peter Vale, as much as it a, a status update, a reflection on the state of the university. And so this evening, we obviously will examine how the state and the intent of the contemporary university um, measures up to Professor Vale's inaugural lecture on home and away, the international and its publics. On these occasions, I often do remark and remind us of Art and Gregorian's hopefulness in reflecting on the state of the university. And his hope and his controversy, dare I say, 
when he announced that universities are not only repositories of past human endeavor, they are instruments of civilization. That's where the controversy lies. He continues, they provide tools for learning, for understanding, and for progress. They are the wellspring of action, a source of self-renewal, of intellectual growth, and of hope. They are a medium of progress, he concludes, of autonomy, of empowerment, of independence, and of self-determination. And obviously this evening we will examine, as we listen to Professor Vail, how his scholar, scholarship, his scholarly work, sits in that hopeful and yet con controversial conversation. As much as in the conversation and the argument of Wernick, who challenges us and says that the university has a contradictory relationship with its surrounding society. On the one side, the autonomy in terms of its axial values of truth, of wisdom, of science, and so on. And on the other side, those, as he continues, who control the means of mental production, material production, control the means of mental production. And the dominant ideas are the ideas of those who dominate. Again, we look forward to this conversation uh, um, initiated uh, by our lecture this evening. And in particular, we also look forward to Professor Maxis Skuman, our respondent, uh, as she uh, rises to the challenge uh, of um, the scholarly uh, work presented this, this evening. Um, all, I, I also share with you reflections of Professor Emmanuel Wallerstein, a good friend of the Faculty of Humanities, uh, who, who remarks that it seems to me that it is the duty of the scholar to be politically and intellectually subversive of received truths, but that the only way this subversion can be socially useful is if it reflects a serious attempt to engage with and understand the real world as best as we can. On these occasions, I uh, remind us, and I hope that it's not just a reminder, but a challenge to the senior scholars that, in fact, there are very few books available in decent bookstores on what it is to be a professor, and in particular, what the freedoms and duties of this most senior scholar of the university is. And I offer you the reflections of Bruce McFarlane, who wrote last year in his book, Intellectual Leadership in Higher Education, Renewing the Role of the University Professor, uh, that in order to correct um, that is, the paucity of, of good books on the state of the, uh, at least on the, the purpose and the role of the professor. He argues convincingly in this book, I believe, that given the corporatization of the research agenda, professors must reclaim professorial leadership and that they do occupy a very special role in this respect. Specifically argues the two freedoms, that of critic and of advocate, are, the, are essential for professors to execute their four duties, which he describes as mentor, as guardian of standards, as an enabler of networking and mobilizer of resources for others, and as ambassador for the institution or discipline. So this evening, we will have only one small insight into how Professor Vail responds to this call for the return of professorial leadership. Let me now invite our acting executive dean, Professor Ronel Yule, to introduce Professor Vail. Thank you very much. Vice Chancellor, Professor Rensburg, members of MEC, ELG, Senate and other academics, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Bell was born in Davoskloof in the Popo province and was raised in Petersburg, now Polokwane, where his divorced mother was a school matron. After matriculating at Capricorn High, he took a BA with majors in Afrikaans, economic history and politics at what he calls that other place, WITS. After a few months teaching school, he turned to journalism while reading honours in international relations. He then briefly taught at Rhodes before joining the South African Institute of International Affairs from where he left um, for the University of Leicester 
to successively read for the MA and a PhD. He returned to South Africa to teach, initially at WITS, before a professorial appointment as Director of Institute of Social uh, and Economic Research at, um, uh, at Rhodes University. In 1989, he moved to the University of Western Cape to find, together with Rob Davies, the present Minister of Trade and Industry, the Centre for South African Studies. For two of the 14 years he was at UWC, he acted as Vice-Rector for Academic Affairs. In 2003, he was appointed as the first Nelson Mandela Professor of Politics at Rhodes. Seven years later, he joined the University of Johannesburg as Professor of Humanities. Among a number of international appointments, Peter Vale has been UNESCO Professor of African Studies at Utrecht, a Fellow at the International Center for Advanced Studies at um, New York University, and Professor of Politics at Macquarie uh, University in Sydney, Australia. Most recently, he was visiting professor at the University of Bergen, Norway. With Jonathan Johnson, he chaired the first inquiry into the humanities in South Africa, and currently he chairs the ASIF uh, Standing Committee on the Humanities. He also chairs the Academic Advisory Board of STIRS, the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study. His awards include the International Medal of the University of Utrecht, um, and the Senior Research Award at Rhodes University, where his 2003 book also received that university's book prize. Professor Vale, uh, vale has wide-ranging scholarly interests, and these are reflected in his publications. In the past year, he has written on South African Marxism, the idea of security, the humanities, threats to the university, uh, on South African intellectual traditions, and on the Cold War and its ending, the latter a chapter in a grade 12 history textbook. In 2011, he also published a book on cartoons and international relations. This year, he delivered the 29th E.H. Carr Memorial Lecture at Abbotsworth University, which is considered to be the most prominent public lecture in the field of international relations. He is the first pro uh, person from the Global South to have so uh, been honored. Peter Vale uh, also regularly writes on higher education for the Mail and Guardian and contributes a monthly column to the Daily Dispatch. He is married to Louise and the couple have two children, Beth and Daniel, who are both postgraduate students in the social sciences. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Vale. Madam Dean, I want to thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you for concentrating on the good things that uh, people say. Um, ladies and uh, Mr. Vice-Chancellor, members of the university, um, friends, old friends and, uh, uh, shall I say, friends of old and uh, new friends, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I see there are a few of my relatives too here, so I'd like to welcome them to uh, this occasion. What I will do is um, tell a few set piece jokes and show a few cartoons. Uh, I want to start with a word of thanks, however. I want to say uh, thank you how grateful I am to the university for asking me to join them. And I also want to say thanks to my colleagues at uh, UJ who have made this part of my career so agreeable and interesting. And at the end of my uh, talk, I would also like to, uh, to issue some thanks. A full two decades after the critical theorists confirmed that the professional was political, feminists pointed out that the personal is also political. <coughs> this lecture, which begins with a, with a confession, explains my own journey towards the same conclusion through a discussion of the field of international re relations called IR in the text, the arena in which I served a happy but not always intellectually fulfilling apprenticeship. My frustration with the field deepened during the apartheid years. Trapped by the logic of the Cold War, the formal study of IR offered very little to South Africa's embattled people beyond that tortuous debate over sanctions. That chain of policy questions which it spawned, and you'll remember them, could they, would they, should they be used against the regime? 
20 years after its ending, I think we are now closer to understanding whether or not sanctions helped or hindered. Today, most conversations on the topic, on the topic of sanctions, are marked more by mythology than by factual evidence and sound logic. And this helps surely to explain why the ongoing tragedy over Syria, on which I'm going to talk a little bit, continues more than 20 years after it was, uh, two years after it was brought before the Security Council of the United Nations. For all its genuflections towards the lessons of history and its claims on normative thought, IR, like all other policy-directed disciplines, is largely ahistorical in its approach to the social world. Any hope of anything better from IR were dashed by the decision of the new South African bureaucrats and politicians, and there are a few of them in the room, backed by the growing authority of experts to invade Lesotho in September 1998. A lot of what I'm going to say tonight, ladies and gentlemen, focuses on experts. So I thought I would uh, 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 tell you a story of something that happened in a Cape court in the 1930s around the question of experts. And this is a joke especially for my friend uh, and uh, my, uh, my friend of old and dear colleague Dion Geldenes. Harry Schnitzer, a man called Harry Schnitzer, was one of the last great advocates in the Cape. He was a specialist in jury trials. Once, and so I read from a very interesting little book, once in a civil trial, he found himself confronted with deadly expert evidence. He had, uh, and he had no answer to it. The case concerned the, th the sale of thoroughbred horses. He addressed the 12 good men, and there were only men in the jury in those days, and they were true countrymen with the wily familiarity of a platelander that he was myself. Meneere, ek het al gehoor van een hunkspert, ook een merrypert, selfs een reisiespert, maar nooit van een expert nie. <laughs> Until the Lesotho invasion, I had an anticipated renegotiation of the subcontinent's political architecture. Sorry, I must do this before I forget. Uh, I had anticipated renegotiation of the subcontinent's political architecture in the hope that both with foresight and fortitude, the very idea of Southern Africa could be conceived anew. In this, the rethinking of the idea of sovereignty would be central. But the closed world of policy making, a place where sovereignty is at once a commanding idea and has a very slippery presence, drove things differently. The Lesotho invasion took place against the backdrop of the breakup of Yugoslavia, especially the issue of Kosovo and a chorus of voices which insisted that global trouble spots could be bombed into a kind of democratic peace. Many, including former Marxists, believed that imperialism in the cause of both human rights and free markets would bring world peace. This approach, as it was said, was the only post-Cold War solution to three perennial problems of interstate relations, domestic conflict, human rights, and world order. It was as if the accumulated knowledge of international relations, which was inspired by the highest ideals, as we will presently see, had little effect on an episteme which was determined to exercise the oldest rule of power politics, namely, might is right. And that is a little cartoon of uh, the nature of international politics and the notion of might is right. Because I believed that there must be other ways to negotiate the international, I set, out anew to under, I set out anew to understand the social world that it makes. This journey has taken me on several detours and in new directions. To arrive, as the poet T.S. Eliot once put it, back where I started and to know the place for the first time. There is a sense, my friends, in which I have returned wiser, though no less idealistic, nor less worried than when I set forth. If anything, I am more pointed in my criticism of international relations and the role it plays both within the academy and in the world. But I am more hopeful that focused critiques of the field, based on openings offered by critical theory, the history of ideas, and the sociology of knowledge, 
and the genealogies which link these disciplines to the world of practice can bring about better understandings, if not quite the peace which the discipline once promised. So what is the issue? The high-minded goal of the study of international relations was, and remains, quote, to save subsequent generations from the scourge of war, as it is famously put in the opening line of the UN Charter. The formal establishment of the discipline of IR predates this great document by almost 30 years. It can therefore be suggested that the founding of the United Nations was a rare moment when an academic discipline, one firmly located in the humanities, Nohal, helped to deliver what today we might call the global public good. And I want to stay with this idea for a few moments. The discipline's founding was linked to a particular set of historical circumstances and took place in an age which believed, following Marx amongst others, science could solve human problems. But if ever there was a leap of intellectual faith, Vice Chancellor, based on bringing humanism, reason and morality towards the real world, the discovery of international relations was it. It rested on a simple idea. Knowledge could end centuries of destruction brought about by anger, ambition and avarice. So the challenge towards which the nation discipline was reached was nothing if not audacious. In the discipline's case, this boundless optimism was brought together in a single act, the establishment of an academic chair of international politics, as it was called, at the University College of Wales in Aberystwyth. The year was 1919. The issue, of the, chair, the issue the chair was called upon to address was the social shock of the First World War. The man behind the chair was David Davies, the grandson of a rich Welsh industrialist of the same name who was a member of the British Parliament. A supporter of the League of Nations, Davies famously claimed once that he was prepared to go to war in the cause of war. And on one occasion he tried to raise a private air force to bomb into peace any state that committed aggression. So ladies and gentlemen, based on this evidence, we should perhaps consider this intervention in the academic field as one of his more controlled efforts to fulfill his passion for peace. His commitment to bring the world to peace through science was certainly within the spirit, both of mourning and renewal that marked the post First World, World, First World War years. For instance, Memorial University in Newfoundland was established in 1925 in memory of those who had perished in the First World War, as six years earlier had the University of Leicester, one of my alma maters, with its pointed motto, Ut Vitum Habient, that they may have life. The memorial, this memorialization has continued for almost a century. The gathering of war veterans at cenotaphs across the world is an annual reminder of solemn undertakings made in November 1918 to end all wars by building a war in more enlightened civilization. The purpose of the Woodrow Wilson Chair in International Politics, as the Aberystwyth site is known, was to call upon governments, often with long traditions, who possessed the most advanced technologies of war, to order. This was to be done by a professor who occupied a chair named for America's 28th president, Woodrow Wilson, who himself was a liberal proponent of peace. All this, of course, was terribly idealistic. But it's easy to understand, to understand the sense of despair which undergirded this idealism. And it is to the First World War, 1914, 1918, that we must now briefly turn. Not for nothing was it called the war to end wars. Consider a few facts. 8.5 million soldiers were killed on, eight, on all fronts. More than 21 million were wounded. Civilian deaths ran to 12, between 12 and 13 million. Quite correctly too, the war was described as a world war. Its geographical spread, which had been reflected by colonialism, was an affront far wider than we'd ever previously be experienced. So aside from the European cockpit, the fighting involved Russia, 
Japan, Africa, the Near and Far East, and ultimately, of course, the United States. Other more distant places were touched in a myriad of ways. India, for example, paid 146 million British pounds towards the war effort. In consequence, it suffered inflation and shortages. Although Africa was spared the worst of its immediate impact, this continent was deeply affected. More, more than two million of our continental fellows were drafted into various forms of what has been called forced labor. And some of them, some of these, uh, of these, some 400,000 died of disease and, ex and exhaustion. This book that I brought along to show people is really a wonderful introduction to the First World War. It's written by the uh, very eminent historian, storyteller, Adam Hochschild. And the book is called To End All Wars, How the First World War Divided Britain. It's a fantastic book, and I can recommend it to, uh, to you, ladies and gentlemen. These remarks will traverse the tragic story of the First World War no further. Its century is upon us. And this will surely provide an occasion for deep discussion and, of course, reading of this book on how all this came to pass. And it is to be hoped that a dedicated series of research agendas, dare we put our faith in the NRF colleagues, will enable us to draw lessons for our age from the events of 100 years ago. And one of those lessons is this. As we have lost a, genera uh, we have lost a generation through HIV and AIDS, so people lost a generation in the First World War. And I think they're really important lessons that we should have a look at over time. My remarks will, no will also no further discuss the history of the discipline, in South except to note in South Africa, an academic chair in international relations named for the statesman Jan Smuts was established in 1962. It was sponsored by the South African Institute of International Affairs and I hope there are people from the Institute here tonight, which had itself been established as a platform to promote international understanding. In the late 50s, in partnership with WITS, the South African Institute of International Affairs set about constructing a memorial to Smuts, which simultaneously would both house its own activities and that of a separate teaching department. The building was called Jan Smuts House, and it has neoclassical architectural uh, features which were intended to symbolize Smuts the Humanist. And the building still stands, as you know, on the eastern perimeter of Witz on Jan Smuts Avenue. The immediate interest of this lecture lies, however, in a direction which is suggested by its title. How did this new field of study seek out and, and develop publics? And what purpose do these publics serve? These questions interse intersect with three puzzles, ladies and gentlemen that occupy my present research agenda. Namely, what is the international? How does it interact with an academic discipline called international re re relations? And how did the international come to South Africa? My thinking about these three issues on this particular academic occasion is essentially a ground clearing exercise for a wider research project. But if this lecture is to succeed, an explanatory note is essential. And here is that note. Theoretical debates in the field have become quite dense, as any reading of the specialist journals will confirm. In what follows, I will caricature some of these, because my interest is to explore the issue of the publics and not international re relations theory. So who is the public? Like so many fields, the idea of the public has its origins in the study of the classics, a field which was dominant in Western education and letters for centuries but which has now apparently been abandoned. This has happened because the classics are judged to be of no practical use in an age in which utilitarian no uh, forms of knowledge are prized above all others, uh, all others. However, ladies and gentlemen, it's a salutary lesson to recall that the study of the classics underpins most of what we know in every conceivable discipline. So reasserting the link between the classics and the unfolding idea of the public on this occasion reinforces the profound loss that all forms of knowledge face when classics department close down. As they will do, my friends, unless serious, peop unless serious minded people speak out about them. And Vice Chancellor, I think it's uh, to the credit of this university that we've kept alive a classics department at this university. There seems no reason why a university cannot have a first class accounting department and a first class uh, classics department at the same time. 
My immediate purpose in mentioning the classics is to draw links between the study of the field and the classics. And three of these come to mind. First, many of the most influential early writers in the, in the discipline never took a course in IR because the discipline didn't exist. But most had read the classics, often at Cambridge and Oxford. Secondly, an intimate link between the classics and IR is drawn from literature, especially in the account of the Peloponnesian Wars, which was presented by the Greek historian Eusidithes. This is considered as a classic IR text, describing a realist view of international politics, which is focused on two issues which we hear every day, state security and national interest. And finally, geographical lines are often drawn between the study of the classics and IR. The historian A. N. Wilson, for example, points to the link between IR and the failed uh, Allied invasion of Turkey during the First World War. The iconic Gallipoli, a space which is said to be sacred to Australians because uh, 8,000 of their soldiers perished on its beaches in five months, abuts the classical world of Greece. So despite IR, IR's preoccupation with the modern, the discipline remains embedded in and inspired by knowledge of the classics. But the impact of these links between the two have spread far and wide, as the decision on the architectural form of Jan Smuts House suggests. If this link with antiquity underscores its claim as a site of knowledge, who is the public? This question gives rise to a series of secondary questions which have policy implications. So, who has claimed to, be, uh, who has claimed to write for membership of the public? Is the claim to membership of the public to be controlled through race, gender, or age? The answer to the, Latin, to the latter question, of course, has been the site of many social and political struggles. And these three in particular are entangled with South Africa's own history. Central to the struggle over apartheid were claims of race. Today, conflicts over women and by extrapolation gender rights in the country continue. And the issue of age arose, of course, most famously when Nelson Mandela in May 1993 advanced the idea that 14-year-olds should be given the right to vote in South Africa's first democratic election. And I'm sure we all remember that occasion. Central to the definition of the public offered by the critical theorist Jürgen Habermas is the fact that the public sphere is part of civil society. It incorporates adults who have gained maturity and intellectual autonomy. And according to Craig Calhoun, a social theorist and the new director of the London School of Economics. The public sphere is oriented, quote, to forming a rational critical opinion on matters of universal interest to citizens and through this to informing state policy. This places the public outside the purview of the state and it binds its members in a sacred trust. The sacred trust is that they must deliberate without fear or favor on the way they are to be governed. If these create a suitable backdrop to the issue of public policy, to, to, to the issue of the public, two closely linked notions of the idea run through this argument. The first of these explains a process through which the public is mobilized, registered, and performed. In distinctive ways, this has been the, set, the ongoing preoccupation of international relations through the near century of its life. This entails the building of discrete constituencies which promote the discipline's founding message and, and uh, sorry, founding message and the exploration of a range of broadcast platforms. These have promoted the idea that IR constitutes a scientific field with a unique social purpose. In the main, these places that I've just mentioned are the target of my critique, as you will discover. This, this uh, runs alongside and complementary to the notion, uh, to a complementary notion this begins with the idea that interpretations of the social world are never static, nor indeed stable, but the world is made as we talk about it. And this little cartoon from the New Yorker shows a little piece of graffiti going on a wall. As you'll see, Jimmy Butler is a communist, and that begins this conversation. Is he a communist? Is he not a uh, communist? And uh, those of you who are on the wrong side of the law during the apartheid years knows what the know what the result of this is. And this, this is the theory of social constructivism, an approach to theorizing the social world which has made a deep impression on the field of IR. As a way of thinking about the international, 
It has challenged the dominant realist paradigm, introducing the field to the idea that questions of knowledge, which is what this exercise is, what it is, how is it's made, are central both to its study and its social mission. We might pause here to ask what is social constructivism? The French theorist Pierre Bourdieu uh, provides an am unambiguous, if dense, Gallic explanation. A social, constructivist, uh, a social constructivist vision of science has to be combined with a constructivist vision of the scientific object. Social facts are socially constructed, and every social agent, like the scientist, constructs and seeks out to impose his individual vision of reality, his point of view. That is why sociology, whether it wants to or not, and mostly it does, is an actor in the struggles it seeks to describe. And the same is true of international re re relations. It lives in, it makes, and it explains the world at the same time. But its relevance to the immediate argument follows a thread first suggested by the public philosopher Hannah Arendt, namely that communication in and to the public includes the idea of world making. So in the very act of speaking about the social world, we make it, as, as we've seen within the cartoon. In this way, the international is constantly being reconstructed in public spaces which deliberate inter alia on the idea and in the field of IR. These spaces are located in various settings, the university, the public square, the generic or specialist think tank, or the purpose-built forums like institutes for international relations or councils devoted to the study of foreign uh, policy. Remember these places, please, because we will return to them too. The institutional power of economics is a good example of how a discipline establishes itself through performance activities in the public domain. And this wonderful little cartoon, also from the New Yorker, as you will see, there's a bunch of uh, bemused people standing next to a cornucopia, and the cornucopia says, please stand by, we are switching to a free market economy. From its modest role as a simple measure of the, of the national household budget, economics has emerged as the single most important social knowing, form of social knowing. This is because this discipline has stepped out of the groves of academia into the world, national policy making in, uh, and international organization. Surely, and on this way we must be clear, its success was the product of a myriad of shifts in conceptual thinking. The most important of these, surely, was the invention of the idea of the market. This is obviously an important issue for critical debate, but on this occasion, ladies and gentlemen, I will reluctantly resist jo uh, joining it. It was a long road from these humble beginnings to the rise, and with luck and perhaps the fall of the Chicago School of Economics, which marked that discipline today. But, the, but this journey involved that discipline's inclusion into the university through credential courses, the establishment of specialist journals, and the founding of dedicated bodies to deliberate in the field. This example suggests, and this is really very important to the discipline, to the discipline and to this lecture, this example suggests that far from being inanimate objects or theoretical notions caught in an ivory tower, academic disciplines, especially in the social sciences, live out complex and very political lives. As they do so, they make and remake themselves in the face of changing intellectual fashions, which determine and are determined by their very public personas. These scattered thoughts provide a platform from which to explain the international at its publics, as the title of this lecture has promised. We will begin with international law, a field which bears a close family resemblance to IR, to use Wittgenstein's famous metaphor. States are artificial constructions because largely they are the product of social and historical contingency, as the theorist Benedict Anderson has pointed out. Recognizing this thing is one thing. Another is understanding that this paradoxically reinforces the notion that geography is destiny. The idea that where states are geographically located has a direct influence on all aspects of their life and being. And I can't resist at this occasion to pause and tell the famous story of Portofino Diaz, the president of Mexico in the 19th century, who famously said, poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States. <laughs> there are many puzzles here, but we will follow the one which leads towards the idea of words. For all the technologies of control around passports and visas, 
The social, a social life seldom ends at the border post. It is always continuous, continuing, albeit contingent. Like the proverbial sentiment about love, the social world seems always to find a way. Evidence of this is to be found everywhere and long preceded the notion of globalization, that much, uh, that much acclaimed borderless world which was said to mark the international after the Berlin Wall fell. If it is true that the social world continues despite borders, what are we to make of the idea of the international? Is it real? Is it illusory? Is it a fiction? Here, etymology is very helpful, but only partially so. The serviceable idea of the international, meaning the cross-border relations between nations, states and peoples, was introduced into, the, into academic discourse by the English philosopher and social reformer, Jeremy Bentham. His years are 1748 to 1832. Bentham, whose mummified body remains on display at University College London, was a utilitarian thinker who was responsible for the introduction of several terms in social science which remain in circulation today. These include codify, maximize, and its antithesis minimize. His purpose with the word international was to dislodge the phrase the law of nation the law of nations by capturing the idea of many nations in a single word. In so doing, Bentham redefined the spatial dimension of inter interstate politics, moving it from the sovereign bound idea of the national to another bounded idea which he called the international. So what he did was to shift political thinking up a rung, even though strictly speaking the word he used was first was was initially an adjective in the phrase international jurisprudence and this is important so the first use of the word international recognized the social world could not be corralled and controlled by by national borders but and this was equally central it implied that it could be controlled by law if bentham's move uh, bentham's move watered the development of two separate though closely interlinked academic disciplines international relations which we've already met and international law. The latter, international law, refers to the system of rules that are regarded as binding on states and other agents in their mutual relations. This approach to, inter to the international aims to create a Kantian world which relies on, on diplomacy, a process which prizes the rational and reasonable of codified, if not always cultivated, behavior, as we have just seen over the Syrian case. But, like life, the rules of this behavior constantly, are constantly reinterpreted. An issue which dogs the field of international law, again as we've seen over Syria. A less immediate case illustrates the same point. The, the idea of empire carried the implication that while located in different parts of the world, and so geographically considered to be international, many places fell under the sovereignty of colonial powers which were located in distant Europe. And of course, this is what so angered the Afrikaners after the Boer War. The people of India also, for instance, were called subjects of an emperor who was also the British sovereignty. But these seemingly unshakable understandings of sovereignty can change very quickly and suddenly. And in the Second World War, in India's case, led to the successful coming of uh, the struggle for India. European public law, which had bound Europe to and in its imperial reach, bent in the face of shifting interpretations and understandings of the international, especially as regards the colonies. This shift provided legal sanction for the continent's freedom movement, which commenced, of course, with the 57 independence of Ghana and ended in 1994, when Nelson Mandela was elected as South Africa's first democratic president. The point has already been made, but it needs repeating. Although the idea of the international appears to be stable, very often uh, it is constantly evolving, uh, even in a field like law. This said, the conversation over international law is bound up with the fact that there is no single body to enact and enforce compliance. So without an implementing force, seemingly contra Bentham, there can be no universal jurisprudence. To counter this, international law develops its own publics in order to foster faith in its importance as a vehicle of peace. Many of these, as we, uh, many of these we might call the high chambers of the international. International organizations like the United Nations operate under a Kantian belief 
that morality can cut across frontiers, bringing about behavior which approximates law. And of course, this is a, a little joke on the United Nations and peacekeepers. To expedite this process of reaching out across the world, specialist institutions have been established. So it is that the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, is the principal legal organ of the, of the UN organization. A second UN court, the International Criminal Court, called the ICC, which was established in 1998, reflects the shifting preoccupations of international law, especially after the Second World War, which was a period marked by a concern for the rights of individuals and not states. This cross-border concern for human rights drove the highly successful international campaign to end apartheid, and its role is rightly celebrated in this country. But it is sobering, my friends, to remember that we in South Africa were only a small link in a chain that began in the struggle to end slavery and continues every day in the struggle for the rights of women, in efforts to end child soldiering, and in the important campaign to stop human trafficking. By bringing perpetrators to account for genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and crimes of aggression, the ICC takes the idea of international law one step further. It says the international can punish the individual. Of course, as we are seeing in, the, in a rather complicated African case, which is unfolding before our eyes, this is very difficult. The appearance of William Ruto, Kenya's vice president before the ICC yesterday, and the certain appearance of his boss, Uhuru Kenyatta, in November, suggests a serious problem with the idea of the ICC, because law and everyday politics are bound to clash in the, in the local and in the international. This, this uh, Vice Chancellor is a significant year in the study of international law because it is the 300th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Utrecht which set many of its rules. There is a poignancy about these rules because amongst its provisions were conditions that opened the world to slave trade. With our ancient links to the Dutch and the importance of grocers in our own legal system, let alone South Africa's long history of slaving, it is quite inexplicable that there's been no effort in this country to look, at the to look into the Treaty of Utrecht on this tricentenary. Positioned on the same frontier of the international law is international re relations. And so we must return to Aberystwyth and the David Davies Initiative. In order to secure a more peaceful world, it was essential to build the interest in the project established by the new discipline of IR. The geographical location in distant Aberystwyth. Professor Skumon is a graduate of Aberystwyth and can tell you that it's a long ride from Birmingham to Aberystwyth on a train. The position of the place uh, was remote from the sources of power which were located in London, then still the centre of international politics and diplomacy. It was also the focal point of Britain's empire, which although past its prime, nevertheless carried an enormous symbolic importance. But Britain had a free press and enjoyed what today we, we would consider to be an active civil society. And early IR drew on these to make its publics. To understand the importance of this, our attention must return to how IR creates its public. It does so, you will remember, by drawing on the idea that public communication is a world-making process. So the grammar and vocabulary of the discipline constantly lives in the public sphere. Its ebb and flow determined by the immediate policy environment which it creates and recreates. And those of you who have been watching the unfolding of the Syrian example, is, this is the case in point of, it, of the grammar making, making the crisis. To date, this world has largely been uh, sustained by realism with its dependency on sovereignty as the central organizing principle of the discipline and its deep pessimism, which is caught in Thomas Hobbes' famous quote that the life of man is as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. During the Cold War, IR's meta-narratives were based on two pessimistic notions which have a long history in politics. The first of these was the idea of terror, which has its roots in the French Revolution, and the second, the notion of balance, which was central to the early operation of the Concert of Europe, which, of course, the Treaty of Utrecht had sanctioned. Drawing these together, Cold War discourse used the meta of a balance of terror, the idea that a nuclear strike by either, the super, by either of the superpowers could destroy the planet. And surprisingly, both the United States and the Soviet Union were terrified to resort to these as a means of waging war. 
but the phrase, but the phrase, the balance of terror, sing, signals something else beside. As any casual reading of the press suggests, there's invariably a sense of urgency attached to every exchange around the idea of the international. Scarcely is there a conversation on the topic which is not cast as an emergency. So to talk about the inter uh, to talk about the international is to signal grave danger, which often reinforces the headlines of the day. We need to be very clear on something here, Vice Chancellor. The nuclear threat was, and remains, a serious one. As of course does every current conversation on Syria, especially over the interest to, over the issue of chemical weapons, if they were used. But although these are wicked problems, to borrow a phrase from social planning literature. To frame every conversation as an emergency closes off a free, unfettered exchange within the public realm. This set of circumstances is further troubled by the fact that international problems are invariably shouted in great secrecy, as the brouhaha over the, over the whistleblower Edward Snowden has dramatically shown. Or, alternatively, caught in impenetrable technical jargon as any attempt to understand the international negotiations over, say, trade, or the environment suggest. Given the closed world these foster, it is no surprise that the same analytical features and often the same words return, uh, the same words which make them return and make the discourse of the international over and over again. This was certainly so in the aftermath of the attacks on the United States which took place 12 years ago today. Those who committed those atrocities were instantly branded as terrorists. While the sense of emergency and the resulting closure of open-ended public conversation led the United States to mobilize the idea of international security under the belief that global order could be, could, uh, could be restored if it led a war on terror. So the argument is that it's a return to this kind of language. The circulation or rather recirculation of these tropes was encouraged by disciplinary gatekeepers who are located in an array of institutions, these are the people I asked you to remember, called Institutes of International Affairs, or in the American case, Council on Foreign Re Relations. Their roots are planted in the same soil as the Aberystwyth chair, and their purpose to promote peace parallels the concern of those who founded IR as an academic discipline. These particular places, ladies and gentlemen, are said to be the brainchild of Lionel Curtis, 1872-1955 a man with close links to South Africa. Born in England with the proverbial silver spoon in his mouth, Curtis fought in the Boer War and was later secretary to Alfred Lord Milner. And so he was part of the Milner Kindergarten, that closed community of experts, most of them from Oxford, that sought to remake, to remake this country in the image of Britain after the Boer War. He then devoted his life to working for a world government which would operate under the British Crown. Their spirit, the spirit of these institutions, was captured in Woodrow Wilson's famous 14-point speech of January 1918. This laid out the idea which intended to bring order following the First World War and included the doctrine of free trade, open agreements between states, the goal of democracy, and the idea of self-determination. This was to take place in a Darwinist world in which the idea of natural progress and growth would follow and would eventually free people the world over. But, ladies and gentlemen, this was a world in which the redistribution of wealth could only, through, could only follow through the rights which were secured by property. And, of course, this issue, who owns what and why, is the central issue of politics. And Wilson's approach to it stood in sharp contrast to that other great social experiment, communism, which was just taking off in the newly formed Soviet Union. And these two conflicting directions set the compass to the Cold War. At one level, uh, institutes and councils concerned with international politics were and remain echo chambers. But, and this follows again the work of Pew Poldoon, they were not objective, nor, in, nor, in, nor indeed democratic councils on the great issues of war, wealth, and weapons. For one thing, the gender attitudes determined that their conversations were mainly concerned, were mainly confined to men. This is a cartoon from uh, the years after the First World War. It's a very very, very cruel cartoon. Because the joke was really that women could never understand these things. And if you look back at it now, it might have been funny at the time if you were one of the elites 
who were looking at this and women would never understand this. But it's an enormously cruel cartoon. And it's sobering to remember that the United States has just had a Secretary of State as a woman and has two senior women now in that um, in, in senior post. And I think, I mean, I think a lot about cartoons, as, as the Dean said, but sometimes you look back on them, they're enormously cruel things. Uh, and it's often important to think about them in the context of that cruelty. These institutes were, for them, were furthermore selective on what could be spoken of. This meant that their idea of the international was geared towards the civilized, which meant that only Christians and whites need apply. These were the sites, ladies and gentlemen, in which the social life of international relations, through meetings, study groups, publications, and other forms of, of public deliberation, were stabilized, and within which the public life, which, which Iowa's political life took hold. It was here that national and international networks in the field were developed. Its members anointed who could speak in and on the field, and, and who not. And in so doing, they became gatekeepers and established the experts. This work was not without self-interest. It was funded by corporates or directly supported by governments. As a result, these places must be seen for what they are, what they were, and what they remain. They are places of knowledge brokers, that core of interested or self-interested participants in an ongoing conversation over the international, whose labor favors a particular form of the world which they constantly make and remake. Their advocacy, often in the name of peace as I've suggested, involves ordering the social world through the circulation and recirculation of a controlling grammar which promotes the idea that the international can only exist under certain conditions. If this is so, it strips these places of their claim to be impartial participants in civil society, notwithstanding their many protestations to the contrary. Operating as think tanks, a classification and an image to which they increasingly lay claim, the work of these places, particularly in the global south, relies on funding of foreign governments and foreign foundations. So the freedom of think tanks to, to represent the interests of the local public is curtailed as their concerns must reflect both funding and media opportunities, which are almost always based in the, glo in the global north. To put it differently, they simply have no autonomy to make impartial judgments. This helps to explain, I think, why there is so little critical engagement of the international system, which is dominated by the United States, and explains why our world, for all the hope attached to the BRICS idea, remains the construction of the North. The final question remains, has the discipline of international relations international relations succeeded in the goals it set itself all those years ago. Drawing evidence from Syria, from the global distribution of wealth, from the sentence recently passed on another whistleblower, Bradley, who now calls himself Chelsea Manning, the answer must be no. But a more honest answer to the question is surely the one offered by the Chinese leader, Zhou Enlai, who in 1972 was asked to assess the significance of the 1782 French Revolution. Too early to say, he said. That, ladies and gentlemen, ends the formal lecture. But I did at the outset say I wanted to issue thanks at the end too. And these are the two gentlemen I want to thank. The one on the left is my English teacher, Muff Potter. The one on the right is Doc Homer, who taught history. They thought that ideas mattered very much in life, as does writing. On occasions like this, Vice Chancellor, we thank the professors who came before us and forget our teachers. This is a great pity. If I have said anything interesting, provocative, funny these past 40 minutes, these are the people who should be thanked. So please join me in applauding these two gentlemen and so celebrating the lives of great teachers. Deputy Vice Chancellors, Madam Dean, colleagues, and friends and family of Professor Bale, and even Dan and Beth in their absence, interesting that both children follow in their father's footsteps. Don't tell them. It is an honor to respond to Professor Bale's inaugural, and I thank him for this invitation. It is not possible to do justice to the richness of the presentation in just a few minutes. 
So I want to make only two comments based on the fact that a good lecture, whether aimed at first year students or at one's peers on an occasion like this, is always something that makes one think and reflect. Professor Vail, as always and as was to be expected, your inaugural lecture this evening provided much food for thought for those of us involved in the discipline of IR as we refer to it. I want to start with where you end. The question about whether IR has succeeded in its original goal of saving future generations from the scourge of war. The obvious answer, as you said, is no. That is when we look at Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia, the DRC. I would venture yet to claim that despite this failure, we can point to pockets of success, small and sometimes not so small peace processes, which ended wars and systems of inequity. Think of Namibian independence, the end of the civil war in Mozambique, and the democratic transition in South Africa. These are examples of successes. These achievements, which were momentous for our region, with the result of negotiation, mediation, talking. And, at least in the case of Mozambique, the mediation was greatly assisted by the involvement of a civil society organization, the community of San Inginio. This brings me to the point about the way in which IR seeks out and develop publics also here in South Africa. I would suggest that your research on this question about the public of IR should not be confined to and by the hallowed walls and walls of the conversation chambers and the think tanks that create and name the experts in the field, who so often serve as the gatekeepers in and of the discipline and of the policy community, who decide and determine the agenda of IR. The successes and failures of our discipline are often, as rightly pointed out by Professor Vail, a product of the types of publics that we create and reproduce in the field. But over the past two decades, I think, IOR's public has moved beyond the think tanks and other conventional publics. Three examples of IOR publics who managed to constitute themselves outside of tra traditional conceptions of this public and who therefore managed to influence the global agenda, I don't say change, but influence, would be those who tirelessly pursued international agreement on a landmine ban in the late 1990s through the Ottawa process, the civil society organizations who together with industry and governments participated in the Kimberley process to stem the flow of conflict diamonds, and the Gaza Freedom Flotilla of 2010. I believe that a consideration also of these outliers would enrich your larger research project and may perhaps bring new insights into the nature and role of IR's publics. Also because these processes and these people involved in them transcend the discourse to engage in action for change. My second comment relates to our discipline. Despite its shortcomings, it is the only academic discipline which at its core deals with the ideal of peace and the end of war and violent conflict. And as you rightly point out, we make the world through words. What then is the world that we as teachers and scholars create through our words? What do we teach and how do we teach? We are largely the creators of IR's publics and we do this through our teaching and through the ways in which we profess. What comes out very strongly in your lecture, Professor Vale, is the fact that the social and cultural life of IR is intricately tied to the complicated social and political life of academia, and the Vice-Chancellor also referred to this, and its interaction with the world out there. Academia is not neutral. Our students leave us and they populate not only the state, but also those echo chambers where the global agenda is set and or debated and <coughs> mediated. Our teaching, therefore, and our research which informs our teaching become, to a large extent, the determinants of who our public is and what agenda they will drive. Let us hope that through the world we make in the words that we use to teach and engage our students, we will also create and populate public spheres that fight for peace and justice, 
often in very practical and tangible ways. This is a huge responsibility. And I thank you for reminding us of this in your excellent presentation this evening. Thank you, Peter. What can I add? Absolutely nothing. Uh, I just want to um, conclude our uh, inaugural lecture this evening by, in the first instance, uh, expressing sincere appreciation, Maxine, uh, for your reflection and for your wisdom. Uh, but in the first instance, of course, to to really extend on behalf of all of us also our congratulations um, to Peter um, for his eloquent yet challenging discursive encounter this evening. Um, uh, I use the words deliberately eloquent but also challenging. Um, for those who are observers of the field, um, I, I think that uh, I looked around the room and I found great focus and great interest in the occasional smile, the occasional laugh, um, but also a deep sense of, of an extraordinary lecture that has enriched us, us all this evening. And so, the, again, the importance of the two freedoms, the freedom to be critic, the freedom to be an advocate, enabling us, providing the platform for our most senior scholars and even the junior ones to be able to interrogate, to be able to challenge, um, to be able to offer us, uh, dare I say, progress uh, as we continue to, to do battle um, both as academic scholars and, as you say, as actors at the same time. So, again, congratulations um, on uh, this uh, inaugural lecture. Um, and so, uh, it is my duty, I guess this is one of the most important duties of Vice-Chancellors, is to inaugurate um, the most senior uh, scholars uh, in the university. And so, it's my duty then to formally, symbolically, ceremonially, to welcome you uh, into the community of the University of Johannesburg's most senior scholars. Welcome. I, I wanted also to say that the applause was somewhat tangled up at the end, and perhaps that was the intention, uh, to tangle it somewhat up, the applause for the lecture and the applause for these outstanding teachers of yours. Uh, and I do think uh, we perhaps could give him another round of applause for his lecture. So, so that brings us to the end of the formal uh, ceremony.